Hello my friends, this is Dr. Beter. Today is February 28, 1981, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 62. Last month I mentioned that I planned to record my AUDIO LETTER on a slightly more flexible schedule. In preparing the first topic of my report to you this month, I have taken advantage of this increased flexibility. For several months now I have been compiling information about a major new story and just within the past few days I've been able to confirm some key final details about it, so thanks to waiting a few extra days I'm now able to give you a much more complete report about it. The story, my friends, is that of the Space Shuttle Columbia now being prepared for launch at Cape Canaveral. This month I am also able to report some encouraging progress with certain Directors of the Regional Federal Reserve Banks. It is only a beginning, but, my friends, I am convinced we are going to win. My three special topics for this AUDIO LETTER are Topic No. 1. The Secret Military Mission of the Space Shuttle Columbia Topic No. 2. The New Ferment of Growing War Tensions and Topic No. 3. Gold Swindles by the Modern Day Money Changers Topic No. 1. One day just over three months ago America's manned space program suddenly started showing signs of life. The day was November 24, 1980, and that was the day when the Space Shuttle Columbia was rolled out into public at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. It was the first public appearance by the Shuttle in almost two years. The Shuttle arrived at Cape Canaveral two years ago next month, March 1979. From then until last November 1980, the Shuttle Columbia remained in hiding in a metal cocoon called the Orbiter Processing Facility, but on November 24 suddenly the cocoon opened up and out rolled the Space Shuttle. The Space Shuttle Columbia made only a short trip that day. It was towed about 300 yards to the nearby Vehicle Assembly Building where it disappeared once again, but we were told that this was only the beginning of a much longer journey. For the first time in nearly six years the United States was committing itself in public to a manned mission into space. The rollout of the Columbia on November 24 took many people by surprise. America's Space Shuttle program is a full three years behind schedule. Ever since late 1977 we've heard about nothing but problems, delays, and more problems with the Space Shuttle. Last November 19, 1980 a former Director of the Apollo Moon Program seemed to summarize it all in disgust. Dr. George Lowe said in a speech in Chicago, quote, Today I wonder whether we could start another Apollo, much less accomplish it, unquote. But only five days after Dr. Lowe said those words, the surprise rollout of the Shuttle Columbia took place. For three years the Space Shuttle program was seemingly placed on hold, yet now the countdown is underway and there is an air of urgency about it. Corners are being cut. Safety precautions are being shortchanged. Unheard of risks are being taken, and when reporters ask why these things are being done, they receive only double talk instead of answers. The Space Shuttle is the most complex American spacecraft ever built. There are more things to go wrong than ever before, and the entire future of America's manned space program depends on the Shuttle. In fact, within a few years we are told that the Shuttle will be launching practically all American satellites. As far as space is concerned, America has put all of its eggs in one basket, the Space Shuttle. With so much at stake, my friends, the old NASA would have proceeded step by step with great care. In the old days each problem had to be solved before moving on to the next phase of a space program. 
and as a final test every new American manned spacecraft made its first trip or two into space without astronauts aboard. That was simply to make sure that there would be no unexpected problems before having astronauts risk their lives. But my friends, that was the old NASA. Those who are calling the shots in America's space program today are a different breed. Our space program has become just one more tool of the Bolsheviks here, and they are interested in only one thing, getting ready for a thermonuclear war. And so a wartime rush mentality is dominating the Shuttle launch preparations right now at Cape Canaveral. This is to be the Shuttle's very first trip into space, and yet it will be a manned mission. We're told that the Shuttle is designed to make at least 100 trips into space and back, and yet NASA says it cannot spare one or two preliminary Shuttle launches in order to check it out. NASA refuses even to consider beginning with a manned suborbital launch like the early manned Mercury shots in 1961. Instead, the very first launch of the Shuttle Columbia is to take it all the way into orbit. My friends, this plan is filled with glaring examples of haste. There seems to be no regard for the safety of the astronauts who will fly it. For example, consider the radically new rocket engines of the Space Shuttle. There are three main engines called SSMEs by NASA. These engines have never flown into space before. In fact, they had never even been fired altogether until just eight days ago. On that day, February 20, the three engines were fired for only 20 seconds on the pad at Cape Canaveral. NASA did not run the risk of running them longer even though these engines are supposed to be reusable launch after launch. Instead, based on a mere 20-second test, NASA will have two astronauts risk their lives on the engines, and in the actual launch into space the engines will not run for just 20 seconds. They must operate for nine minutes. NASA is now gambling that the three fresh engines on Columbia will last long enough to get into orbit. But the Shuttle engines are only one example of NASA's unexplained haste, because if Columbia does reach orbit, the next question is, can it return? My friends, the answer is NASA does not know. By now you have probably heard or read about the radically new thermal protection system of the Space Shuttle. All of our previous spacecraft had heat shields which carried away heat by burning away during re-entry. Therefore they could only be used once, but the Shuttle is supposed to be reusable over and over, so it requires a different kind of heat shield. It is a lightweight ceramic broken up into more than 30,000 small pieces called tiles. For at least two years now we have been hearing stories about problems with the tiles. It began when the Shuttle Columbia arrived at Cape Canaveral in March 1979 on the back of a jumbo jet. Many tiles had been lost or damaged during the flight, and the Columbia looked like it had smallpox. Soon after that we started hearing about tiles being tested removed, replaced, retested, and so on. Part of the controversy over the tiles is real. There are legitimate arguments among many space engineers whether the tiles will succeed or fail. Those questions will finally be answered one way or another only when and if the Shuttle Columbia drops out of orbit to return to Earth. But for the Bolsheviks who now control America's space program, the arguments over the tiles are only a tool. The tile controversy made a perfect cover story to explain away the three-year grounding of the Space Shuttle. The real reason is that America has been virtually locked out of military space missions since late 1977. As recently as August 1977, 
It had looked as if the United States would soon be eclipsing Russia with new space exploits. That month the first free flight tests of the Space Shuttle took place. A shuttle was carried aloft aboard a jumbo jet, then cut loose and guided to Earth by astronauts. The test went perfectly. The era of the Space Shuttle was about to dawn, or so it seemed. Meanwhile Russia's space program seemed completely silent. But everything turned upside down the following month, September 1977. Russia began deploying her secretly developed charged particle beam weapon in space, and on September 27, 1977, history's first true space battle took place, the Battle of the Harvest Moon. I reported it that month in AUDIO LETTER No. 26. In a stunning upset, Russia smashed America's secret military control of space. Two days later Russia's manned space program suddenly came to life. Russia launched the Salyut 6 space station on September 29, 1977, and from that day to this there has been a steady stream of Russian cosmonauts into space and back. Even cosmonauts from seven other countries have been whisked into space by Russian rockets. There have even been cosmonauts in orbit from Cuba and Vietnam. Meanwhile American astronauts have been able to do nothing but grind their teeth and watch. The Bolsheviks here, my friends, have been waiting and watching for a moment of weakness among their enemies, the secret new rulers of Russia. The Bolsheviks want to regain their former positions of power in Russia, but for years now Russia's new rulers have been expelling the Bolsheviks, who have flocked mostly here to the United States. When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 55 last June 1980, I reported that a moment of weakness was developing in the Kremlin. Bolshevik forces had succeeded in penetrating the Kremlin. They were wreaking havoc among Russia's top leadership. At the same time, Russia's expulsion of Bolsheviks slowed to a trickle. Emigration from Russia was at its lowest level in years during the second half of 1980. So the decision was made last July to go ahead with a Space Shuttle mission. For the first time in three years there appeared to be a chance of slipping through Russia's space blockade. Even so, any American attempt to launch a manned military mission into space will be very risky. It dare not be attempted until a mission is ready that is worth the risk. The Bolsheviks are now ready with that mission. It is the secret payload now in the cargo bay of the Space Shuttle Columbia. It was developed in association with the super-secret National Reconnaissance Office whose very existence is regarded as secret in government circles. When Russia began her surprise space offensive in September 1977, she did so by destroying an American spy satellite on September 20. A week later America's secret moon base was put out of action, which freed Russia's hands to pour into space. In the months that followed, Russia gradually knocked out all of our spy and early warning satellites one by one. When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 33 seven months later, I reported that Russia had finished the job. Since that time, April 1978, America has had no spy satellites on continuous duty over Russia. Several spy satellites have been launched since then, but each one has been knocked out quickly. Not one has lasted for as long as one week. But these brief spy satellite missions have alerted the Bolsheviks here to one thing. That is, there are major changes taking place among the potential wartime targets in Russia. Some known targets from the past are becoming less important, while other new targets have been detected. Last June in AUDIO LETTER No. 55 I outlined the secret plan for an American nuclear first strike against Russia. That plan relies on missiles, including America's secret mobile missile the Minuteman TX, and it cannot succeed without up-to-date information on the targets in Russia. 
As I will outline in Topic No. 2, the Bolsheviks here are once again doing all they can to get set for a nuclear war, so they are desperate for new up-to-date reconnaissance data from Russia. In other words, they must have an operational spy satellite which can survive in orbit for a while, and the Bolsheviks here now believe they have developed that kind of satellite. Eventually they know that Russia's orbital fleet of manned Cosmos interceptors will succeed in destroying it, but before they can do so, military planners here believe the satellite will be able to radio back enough information to work with. And so, my friends, the first flight of America's Space Shuttle, the Columbia, is to be a secret military mission. Its purpose is to prepare for war. That is why there is such a frantic effort to rush to launch with unproven hardware, and that is why the very first mission will be manned instead of an unmanned test shot. It has to be manned because of the secret cargo it is carrying in its huge cargo bay. When the shuttle reaches orbit, if it reaches orbit, astronauts will be required to deploy the military satellite inside. The satellite is basically a spy satellite, but it is also much more. In order to do its job, it is designed to fend off Russian space weapons for as long as possible. As a result, it will be nothing less than a robot battle station in space. In space terminology, it is a hardened satellite able to withstand an attack without being easily destroyed. It is also equipped with active defenses, meaning it can shoot back. Right now the components of the satellite are crammed into the cargo bay of the Shuttle Columbia. They were already there when the Columbia was rolled out last November. Once in orbit, the job of the astronauts, John Young and Robert Crippen, will be to assemble it and get it operating, and fast. Once it is assembled and floating in space, the satellite will look like a giant rotating tin can, perhaps 30 feet long and 20 feet in diameter, but on closer inspection it would seem to be made more like a wooden barrel, except that the barrel staves are all made of a whitish metal, tungsten. Several of these metal sections can be retracted on automatic command, making the satellite look like a shiny barrel with a few staves missing. Inside the outermost tungsten barrel is another smaller barrel, and inside that is a still smaller barrel. Finally, at the very center is the heart of the satellite itself. The tungsten barrels are separated from one another by a foot or more of space. There is also considerable space between the innermost barrel and the core satellite. The tungsten barrels constitute the passive defense of the satellite. If a charged particle beam blast strikes the outermost barrel, it will vaporize a spot on the barrel, but in the process it will absorb energy and diffuse the beam. In theory, that will greatly reduce the damage done to the second barrel and do no damage at all to the innermost barrel. Tungsten has the highest melting point of any metal, so this system of particle beam shields is expected to last through a number of battles. The three-layer tungsten shield system is also instrumented. When a blast strikes it, the blast pattern will be sensed as an initial indication of where the attack is coming from. A computer in the core satellite will then activate a secret new target acquisition system called LADAR, L -A -D -A -R, meaning Laser Direction and Ranging. The movable barrel stave sections of the rotating tungsten shields will be opened up. LADAR will peek out through the openings as they rotate past in ultra-fast scanning. In the black void of space, LADAR is expected to be much more efficient than radar, picking up the Russian attacker quickly, and the moment it does, the American robot battle station will open fire. When it does so, it will pose a major threat even to a Russian Cosmos interceptor, because, my friends, the American satellite 
will be armed with a giant carbon dioxide gas dynamic laser. It is a more compact version of the laser which has been successfully tested aboard a modified KC-135 jet tanker. It produces intense infrared radiation with a power of over 1 MW, that is, 1 million watts. What can a 1 MW laser do? Let me give you an idea. An industrial 10,000 watt laser can slice through a 1 inch thick steel plate in a matter of seconds. The satellite laser is 100 times that powerful. It is not as powerful as a Russian charged particle beam, but it is powerful enough to cripple or destroy a Russian attacker. That is, my friends, if the Space Shuttle Columbia makes it into orbit, and if Young and Crippen succeed in deploying the satellite, but will they? In the past I have given many details about the clever deceptions which have surrounded our space program, but, my friends, the deceptions of the past were child's play compared to what we are about to witness, because the Bolsheviks here must get their robot battle station into orbit without letting you know about it, and whether they succeed or fail they must try to maintain the appearance of success. As I mentioned earlier, everything is riding on the Space Shuttle. So I will now describe the plan for the coming flight of the Columbia. I will describe what you will see if the plan works, and I will also describe what will really be taking place, which is far different. According to the latest schedule, the Columbia is intended to lift off on a sunny morning in mid-April 1981. Millions will watch on television as Young and Crippen roar upward into the sky and into orbit. Then the scene will shift to the standard coverage of Young and Crippen in their cockpit, and for a little over two days the coverage will continue off and on. There will be cockpit scenes, scenes in mission control, and so on, and there will be some seemingly unexpected problems, nothing serious but just enough to add a touch of spice to it all. It will look for all the world like the real thing. Television viewers will have no suspicion that they are only watching excerpts from numerous simulations of the flight. In its cover-up of the Skylab fiasco, NASA learned well the techniques of deception. Meanwhile, there will be no television coverage at all of the real flight except for the initial liftoff. Instead, when Young and Crippen reach orbit, they will go to work fast. They will depressurize the cabin, open the cargo hatch, and move the robot spy satellite components away from the Columbia. They will also remove a Gemini Type II manned space capsule from the Columbia cargo bay. After moving these things several hundred yards away from the Columbia, the two astronauts will close the cargo bay by remote control. They will maneuver down underneath the Columbia for a quick visual inspection of the condition of the thermal tiles, but the urgency of setting up the robot satellite will leave no time for any attempt to repair any tiles. If the astronauts were to do that, they would lose precious time both in setting up the satellite and in making good their own escape in the Gemini capsule. This, my friends, is why NASA has refused to include a tile repair kit on the first shuttle mission. As NASA Administrator Robert Frosch said in a recent news conference, quote, I felt in the end that it would be likely to increase risk, perhaps not risk with regard to the tile system, but risk with regard to the safety of the whole flight." Unquote. After the briefest of inspections, the astronauts will turn over control of the Columbia to NASA Houston with the words, OK for retrofire. Then they will float away from the Columbia and set to work quickly on assembling the Robot Spy Satellite. It is expected that they will complete the job within three to four orbits. As soon as the Robot Satellite is assembled and operating, Young and Crippen will board their Gemini-type space capsule. If all goes according to plan, they will drop out of orbit and splash down in the Pacific Ocean. It will only be the evening of the same day they took off. But on television the falsified NASA coverage will still be showing tapes of Young and Crippen in the simulated cockpit 
of the Columbia. Young and Crippen are planned to be picked up at sea after their secret splashdown. From there they are to be transported to Edwards Air Force Base in California to await further events. Meanwhile, about 12 hours after the launch from Cape Canaveral, Houston will send a retrofire signal to the unmanned Columbia. The shuttle's engines will fire. Somewhere over the Indian Ocean the Space Shuttle will enter the atmosphere. It will be the first complete test of the shuttle's thermal tiles. If they work, Columbia will survive re-entry. Then at lower altitude, piloting of the Columbia will be taken over by remote control. If all goes well, the Columbia will touch down in the great sandy desert of Western Australia. If all goes according to plan, all these things will take place during the first day of the supposed 54-hour mission of Young and Crippen. Then for the final act of the charade we will be told on television that the Columbia is re-entering over the Pacific Ocean, and finally, lo and behold, the Space Shuttle will glide into view. Everyone will watch in fascination as the Shuttle dips lower and lower over Edwards Air Force Base, California. Finally, it will touch down on the dry lake bed and gradually break to a stop, and out will climb Young and Crippen. Everyone will assume that they are climbing out of the Columbia, but, my friends, they will actually be climbing out of a different shuttle named the Enterprise. It was the Enterprise which we saw in those landing tests in August 1977, and it will again be the Enterprise which we will see making another landing soon. It will be retouched to look like it came from space but it will be a fraud. My friends, that is the plan as it now stands, but there may well be some big surprises. The Bolsheviks here have devised a robot battle station to spy on Russia and defend itself against Russian space weapons, but it is designed primarily with Cosmos interceptors in mind, and while American designers have been devising ways to counter the Cosmos interceptors, Russian technology has also been advancing. The secret military mission of the Space Shuttle Columbia is a desperate gamble. If it succeeds, it will bring the world much closer to thermonuclear war. If it fails, we may well be witnessing America's final manned mission into space. Topic No. 2 in AUDIO LETTER No. 59 last October I reported that the Bolsheviks here were trying to set up a new strategy to bring on NUCLEAR WAR ONE. They had been foiled repeatedly in their attempts to trigger a war by means of our hostages in Iran, so they were devising a new plan which was to be set in motion after releasing the hostages. When voting machines registered a surprise landslide in the name of Ronald Reagan last November, it set a deadline for arranging a hostage release. That deadline was Inauguration Day, January 20, last month. Otherwise the Bolsheviks were in danger of losing control of the Iran crisis which they themselves had created. And so at the very last minute our hostages were released last month. Contrary to the original plans of the Bolsheviks here and in Iran, our hostages came home alive. But now new maneuvers are underway to bring on war. Bolshevik agents are stirring up Poland in never-ending strikes and turmoil. Having failed in their Pope's Revolution plan of two years ago, they're trying to make Poland explode in a different way. Meanwhile, to keep Russia's new rulers off balance, another crisis has been created in our own hemisphere, El Salvador. CIA operatives are stirring up both sides in the Civil War there in order to have something to blame on Cuba. As always, the Russians are reacting strongly to the implied new American threats against Cuba, so El Salvador is serving its purpose as a tool to stoke up tensions between Russia and the United States. The El Salvador crisis contains echoes of Operation Guyana two years ago. Now as then, 
Russia is being encouraged to worry about Cuba as a diversionary tactic, and just as happened in Guyana, human lives are being sacrificed purely to attract attention. Public attention was first riveted on Guyana by the Port Kaituma Airport massacre, and not long ago public attention was focused on El Salvador by the murder of four religious workers. All this is to help catch Russia off guard later on when the arena of conflict shifts once again to the Persian Gulf area. Once again secret plans are being laid to create conflict between Israel and Saudi Arabia. For that purpose the United States has just announced that it will sell offensive armaments for Saudi Arabia's F-15 fighter bombers, and at the same time there are planted reports that the Saudis favor a jihad, a Muslim holy war, to retake Jerusalem. Right now all this is going on quietly. It is not highlighted in our controlled major media, but the preparations are underway now for a Persian Gulf explosion later this year of 1981. When that takes place, the plan is to focus all eyes once again on Iran. At a critical moment, the shaky Iranian government will be brought down. Suddenly that will leave Russian forces on the north and American forces on the south with a vacuum in between, and almost overnight the stage will be set for a nuclear confrontation. As a preliminary step, the plan is also to declare a national economic emergency here in the United States. That will trigger the emergency powers of the President, and while we will be told that it is all to fight inflation, it will actually be to prepare for a nuclear war. My friends, if all this is to be stopped, we must go to the source of the Satanic power. That power is money power, wrongly used. It is the power of the modern-day money changers in our land, so it is to them that I now direct your attention. Topic No. 3 When our Lord Jesus Christ walked the earth nearly 2,000 years ago, He did many miraculous things. He healed the sick, He fed the hungry, He loved the unloved. In short, he went about doing good. Most of the time our Lord astonished everyone with His patience. When He taught, He found that people did not pay attention, and so He had to teach them the same lesson over and over again, and yet He never once grew angry with anyone who was seeking to learn. Even so, He also told His disciples, Do you think that I have come to bring peace? No, not peace, but a sword. He explained that there must be a division between those who are for God and those who are against God. And as gentle as he was with the weak, he displayed a fiery anger with those who were swollen up with arrogant power. And one time the anger of our Lord Jesus Christ exploded into violence. That one occasion, my friends, was when He confronted the money changers in the temple. The temple money changers possessed a money monopoly. Everyone who came to worship presented offerings to the priests, and to buy something to offer they had to use a special temple money, so called. The temple money was not really money at all. It was only a kind of script with no intrinsic value. But everyone who came to worship, from the richest to the poorest, had to turn in good coins of gold, silver, and copper to buy the scrip. That was the only way that they could buy a sheep or a ram or a dove to offer to the priest. The money changers really performed no useful function at all, but thanks to their money monopoly they extracted tremendous profits from everyone else. When Jesus saw all this, He became enraged. The money changers were so corrupt that they were standing in the way of worship itself in order to make money, so Jesus wasted no time trying to reason with them. Instead He seized a whip and went after them. 
He drove away the money changers. He knocked over their counting tables, and seizing their bags of money obtained by a form of theft, he ripped them open and spilled them out. My friends, today it is you and I who are at the mercy of the money changers. We too have been forced to give up real money made of silver and gold. Instead, we are forced by the Federal Reserve money monopoly to deal in Federal Reserve IOUs, nothing but paper scrip. And in return, the arrogant money changers of today, the Bolsheviks, are trying to take everything from us. They are eating up our savings by creating inflation through interest rates which create no new wealth. They are using their money power to betray us into nuclear war, and they are even trying to destroy the Christian faith itself by constantly working to pervert our religious practices. Like the money changers of old, haters of our Lord Jesus Christ are once again sitting in the temple. Almost from the moment our Republic was founded, the money changers started trying to seize control of America's money. First the idea was called the Bank of the United States. Such a bank did exist for a while with a charter granted by Congress, but on July 10, 1832, President Andrew Jackson put a stop to the central bank idea for a while. Congress had passed a bill to give a new 20-year charter to a Bank of the United States. Jackson vetoed the bill with the words, Every monopoly and all exclusive privileges are granted at the expense of the public, which ought to receive a fair equivalent. In other words, Jackson was insisting that the public be treated fairly. But my friends, the money changers never give up. In 1913 they finally got what they wanted. It is called the Federal Reserve System. Nowadays few people know the story of how the Federal Reserve System came into existence. Suffice it to say that it took only a few of the international bankers to do it without great fanfare. One man more than any other was the father of the Federal Reserve in its present form. As the Proceedings of the Academy of Political Science of Columbia University put it, quote, the Federal Reserve Act will be associated in history with the name of Paul M. Warburg, unquote. In order for Warburg and his associates to quietly get this legislation past Congress, he had to overcome one objection. That major objection was to the creation of only one central bank which would obviously be a monopoly. Warburg got around that by conceiving the 12-bank Federal Reserve System, but when a Senator asked him how he would maintain control of 12 banks instead of the single bank he favored, Warburg answered, quote, It is a little bit complicated. Which objection, however, can be overcome in an administrative way." Unquote. In other words, my friends, he could short-circuit the 12-bank system and do what he wanted a central bank to do by administrative techniques. And that is what has been done in the situation over our missing gold. The real central bank is the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and the administrative arm of that central bank is actually the Board of Governors here in Washington. The New York Bank, the Board of Governors, and agents within the United States Treasury Department all work hand in glove. It is they who constitute the modern-day money changers in our land. In all of this, the other 11 regional Federal Reserve Banks just go along for the ride. They do possess latent powers of their own, but thanks to Warburg's administrative techniques, quote unquote, they are always indoctrinated not to exercise those powers. Instead, the eleven regional banks outside New York are treated like children by the money changers in New York and Washington. They are given big buildings, fancy offices, impressive stationery, fat salaries, numerous advisors, and impressive titles, but they are always told in effect Leave all the thinking to us big boys. 
Year in and year out, the regional Federal Reserve Banks, all except New York, are kept in the dark. So last month in AUDIO LETTER No. 61 I tried to light a candle in that darkness. All of the Federal Reserve Banks share in the responsibility for safeguarding our gold. The Presidents and Directors of all the banks are now on legal notice concerning those responsibilities. So from now on they will have no excuse. Either they are for us or they are against us. They must make a choice. They do hold power, and those who hold power must be held accountable for the consequences of its exercise. The question we have posed is very simple and very basic. Either America's gold is there or it is not there. We want an indisputable physical inventory to find out once and for all. So we have appealed to the regional Federal Reserve Banks to wake up, to flex their muscles for once, and to bring about an inventory. My friends, I want to thank all of you who followed through on what I asked you to do last month, and I want to let you know the results so far. Up to now the Federal Reserve System is continuing to maintain its false outer appearance of unruffled unity, but behind that facade little cracks are beginning to open up. It's true many of the regional bank directors have so far been unable to open their minds to the truth. But there are some important exceptions. One high official of one regional Federal Reserve Bank is being very cooperative up to now. Very quietly he is providing us with important information. He has not yet gone so far as to demand an inventory, but he is responding with an open mind. At one other regional bank a high official has signaled to us that he is seriously concerned but up to now he is still sitting on the fence. Beyond that I have also received reliable reports that scattered around the country a number of regional Federal Reserve Directors are troubled. Until last month they had never been given one hint of their own legal responsibilities regarding the gold. My friends, all this is at least an encouraging start, but it is clear that they are going to take more convincing. We should not be surprised at that nor discouraged by it. Many of these men have been associated with the Federal Reserve System for many years. Human nature being what it is, they naturally find it hard to accept the fact that the wool has been pulled over their eyes. Typically these are highly educated men. They are not stupid. They will have to swallow their pride in many cases if they are to see how thoroughly they have been fooled and used. Over the past six or seven years I've made public many facts uh, which these men should consider for their own good, but rather than go back over any of those again, I want to report three new ones. The discrepancies surrounding our gold supplies just go on and on, my friends. First let me refer to the Treasury Inspector General's report to Senator William Proxmire dated last September 30, 1980. This so-called report came about because of your letters to Senator Proxmire. The subject was the missing gold shipment from Fort Knox of January 20, 1965, which I have discussed in past AUDIO LETTERS. The shipment amounted to over one and three-quarter million ounces of gold worth around a billion dollars at today's prices, yet it was omitted from official Treasury shipment listings. Recently this feeble excuse for a report has been cited by the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. For example, on February 2, 1981, Theodore E. Allison, Secretary of the Board of Governors, wrote to the President of the Philadelphia Bank, Mr. Edward G. Bone. Bone had written to the Board of Governors in response to your inquiries, and with their letter of reply the Board enclosed the Treasury Inspector General's report. My friends, I have mentioned before that this report is totally unsatisfactory. It is a fraud and a farce, yet now the money changers of the Board of Governors are falling back on that report as one way to calm down the regional banks. So I think it is appropriate to give you just one example of the glaring errors sprinkled throughout the report. 
I also want to do this because some of you have asked me to say more about it. If you have a copy of the Treasury Inspector General's report, please look on page 2. The third paragraph refers to the missing shipment of January 20, 1965. It says very impressively, quote, This shipment was receipted for on Treasury Department Form TUS 12B, Receipt for Forwarding Depository, Voucher No. 65-1, on January 22, 1965, by John P. Bath, an employee of the New York Assay Office." Unquote. Sounds cut and dry, doesn't it? Sorry, my friends. It so happens that the New York Assay Office had no permanent employee named John P. Bath on January 22, 1965. So if the receipt quoted by the Treasury Inspector General exists at all, it means absolutely nothing. It is fraudulent. That is the kind of report which Senator William Proxmire was so eager and happy to settle for. And that is the kind of report which the Federal Reserve Board of Governors now uses to soothe the regional banks. If the regional Federal Reserve Banks want to swallow that, then shame on them. Now let me give you a second example, another major discrepancy in the records of the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. I have spoken before about the so-called London Gold Pool, which operated between 1961 and 1968. This is the official cloak of authority which was used during that period to explain the hemorrhage of gold out of Fort Knox. According to official Treasury records, some 219.5 million ounces of gold left Fort Knox. Of that amount, supposedly a little over 9 million ounces went to the New York Federal Reserve Bank. The other 210 million ounces were supposedly destined for the London Gold Pool. But now let me give you the conflicting statements of former Treasury Secretary William Simon. On May 4, 1976, he wrote to then Congressman John Conlon of Arizona. Conlon had requested some better answers from Simon than he had given previously to questions about our missing gold. Simon spent over two months constructing a reply to Conlon's February 26, 1976 letter. Simon sent Conlon a two-page letter plus an eight-page memorandum trying to refute the charges. At one point in the memorandum, Simon says, quote, The statement which alleges that the shipments of gold to London for the London Gold Pool arrangement were used as a cover for secret losses of United States gold simply isn't true, unquote. And yet, just four sentences later, Simon says, quote, when the arrangement was terminated by the Washington Agreement of March 1968, the United States had made net sales to the pool during its period of operation totaling 45.2 million ounces." Unquote. Now let's compare two numbers side by side, my friends. First is Simon's number. As Secretary of the Treasury, he said that the United States sent only about 45 million ounces of gold net to the London Gold Pool, but Treasury records give a different number. At least 210 million ounces disappeared from Fort Knox alone during that period. If only 45 million ounces went to the Gold Pool, as Simon said in writing, what happened to all the rest? 210 million minus 45 million leaves 165 million ounces of gold from Fort Knox unaccounted for. Yet I repeat, the only excuse ever given for the Fort Knox gold hemorrhage was the London Gold Pool. My friends, that unaccounted for gold is Federal Reserve gold belonging to the American people. As I detailed last month, the Federal Reserve title to the gold is beyond legal dispute. Every officer and every director of every regional Federal Reserve Bank shares a legal responsibility if that gold is missing and if they do not investigate. The incredible discrepancy I have just revealed is in black and white 
in Treasury statements. Do the regional banks dare to close their eyes to it? If so, God help us all. Now let me report just one more mystery to you about our gold. This one did not take place years ago, but just this month, February 1981. Last month our hostages were finally released from Iran. Most of the last-minute settlements involved banking matters. Most of all, Iran demanded that 1.6 million ounces of gold be returned. According to all the news reports, the return of Iran's gold was arranged by cable transactions between the Federal Reserve System and the Bank of England. Supposedly, Iran's 1.6 million ounces of gold was safe and sound at the New York Federal Reserve Bank. By a system of banking credits, this amount of gold was reportedly credited to Britain's gold stock here in America. Then the Bank of England turned over an equivalent amount of gold into Iran's custody in London. We were told that no gold actually left America in this transaction. But, my friends, that is a lie. Simply put, Britain's bankers do not trust us. The Bank of England secretly demanded that Iran's 1.6 million ounces of good delivery gold be physically sent to London. And so on February 7, just three weeks ago, there was a secret gold shipment to London by air. It came to about 1.6 million ounces, but it did not come from the New York Federal Reserve Bank. It was not Iran's gold. Instead, the shipment was made from the New York Assay Office. Dregs of junk gold from Fort Knox were scraped together, then it was rushed to London in secret. My friends, this raises a very serious question. If Iran's gold still existed at the New York Bank, why was that not sent to London? Why was the New York Assay Office given a panic refining job to scrape together the gold? In any case, the gold that went to London was not Iranian gold. It was Federal Reserve gold, part of the small amount still left in this country. It was taken from the dregs of junk gold removed from Fort Knox for auctions in the recent past. As I reported more than five years ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 5, any gold left in Fort Knox is radioactive. It has been contaminated by plutonium superpoison stored in the gold vault by the CIA in the late 60s. Recently a leading Swiss bank refused to take delivery of Fort Knox gold purchased in a gold auction. Their tests proved that the gold was indeed radioactive, so the Bank of England should test the gold which they just received very carefully. The secret gold shipment of February 7 further depleted what little is left of the Federal Reserve gold. It took place with the knowledge and collusion of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors and the New York Bank. But once again the other 11 regional banks have been taken for a ride. It may well be that they do not even know about this latest disappearance of their gold. If not, they have once again been used by the money changers who control them. My friends, there are mountains of evidence that our gold reserves are not as claimed. But will the regional Federal Reserve bankers wake up in time? Will they take action to save both themselves and our country? If they do not act, what lies ahead may well be foreshadowed in these words written to a commercial banker by one of my listeners. More and more of my friends and people I know are withdrawing all their funds held in banks, then dealing in cash, silver, gold, and barter systems for their transactions. Banks and bankers, through not serving the true interests of the people, are losing any useful place in society. Now it is time for my last-minute summary. As I say these words, the Space Shuttle Columbia is being readied for a desperate secret military mission. Once again powerful forces here in the United States are bent on war, nuclear war. 
Our own money has been taken away from us in order to finance preparations for warfare that will destroy us. The evil which is being planned for us all has one root. That root is a satanic and perverted money power. If we are serious about saving our land, we must pull up that root. We must do as our Lord Jesus Christ Himself did long ago. We must drive out the money changers and restore honor and honesty to our land. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.